Today we have sermon as truth telling. Telling the truth about what happened this week and about how I feel about it. And I'll start with like, it is okay for you to be feeling how you're feeling. And we might not feel the same way. <laughs> we might not be having the same emotions or the same uh, takeaway. But if you're upset and hurting in some way, however you are here, know that you are held in the love and care of this community. And there's a love holding all of us. My dears, I am so angry. <laughs> I am so angry that a white supremacist extremist mob stormed our Capitol on Wednesday. I am mad that Trump and his allies in Congress encouraged them to do so. I am so angry that they were allowed largely to waltz in, cause destruction and violence, and leave unharmed largely and without consequences largely. As we said in our statement from the standing committee and me and the staff this week, I witness and condemn the hypocrisy of a militarized and white supremacist policing system, which reacts with extreme violence to people of color peacefully protesting, while white supremacist insurrectionists face only a fraction of that force. I changed the last word a little bit. I'll tell you more in a minute. Many of you know that I worked and lived in Washington DC for five years, right after college. And I have been in and out of those Senate and House office buildings and legislative chambers. And the show of force and security that's present there in our post 9-11 era is quite extensive. I was once expelled from, I think it was a Senate office building for attempting to deliver packets of letters in the wrong way from a coalition of very boring, very mainstream organizations, including our Unitarian Universalist Association. And I was a nice, blonde, conventionally attractive, young white lady in a suit. Exactly the kind of body that our policing systems purport to protect and often do. Heck, these days though, even white protesters are treated worse if they are left wing than right wing. Protesting systems of oppression and violence rather than upholding them. And you know, you know what would have happened if this had been black protesters outside the Capitol. You know what has happened. You have seen it. You have seen over and over police officers kill black people for existing, let alone protesting near powerful white people, let alone breaking into the Capitol. Don't let anyone gaslight you into thinking that you haven't seen the double standard in stark clarity. It is not an accident that our country's security apparatus allowed Wednesday's insurrection to happen. At the least, there was operating the kind of unconscious bias that operates in and through most of us, the kind of um, unconscious bias that allows most law enforcement officers and um, most of us white people um, and a lot of people of color as well to see uh, white bodies as safe and black bodies as threatening, and other people of color as various degrees of threatening, foreign, inferior, and or invisible. It also seems inconceivable that security leaders were unprepared. Security leaders had to have made deliberate choices for the police to be so unprepared. And reporting on this is, of course, still emerging, but I will be shocked if there aren't significant things to emerge. This isn't to um, downplay the reality of the experience of some Black Capitol Police officers. 
um, running for their lives, being injured. Um, there's reporting on exactly how uh, abandoned and betrayed they feel by their leadership. So I feel mad and I also feel very naive because I let myself believe this wouldn't happen. I believe that getting through election day and Biden winning the election meant that we had, a, that we as a country wouldn't be seeing the attempted coup that organizers had been warning about. And I feel naive for again, allowing myself to think that um, police and security apparatus would protect the operation of government from white supremacist extremists. And I feel naive because I've been told better. People of color organizers, people who study white extremism, especially what black women who fall into some of those categories as well, um, were not surprised. They tried to tell everyone for years that this was the logical consequence of what's been going on. So I feel naive that I didn't know that I didn't expect. I didn't listen. What will I do and expect next? The title of this sermon is On the Threshold, which to be honest, I planned before Wednesday. And this is where we are. We are at the beginning of a new year in between election and inauguration just at the beginning of the vaccine distribution, straining to see the end of the pandemic. We're in what's called liminal space, which is from, from the word limin, limin, which literally the board on the threshold of the door. This is also a season for thresholds, metaphorically and literally in Christian tradition, the season of epiphany. Uh, it's when the Magi finally arrive to see the baby Jesus. They, didn't, they don't arrive for a while, they, they come, 13 days late. A ritual of this season is for Christians to mark a blessing on their home doorways with chalk. So Epiphany, the Magi, the doorways with chalk, this is a story and a season of with themes of hospitality and vision, of welcoming, of intention. The wise stranger arrives bearing gifts for the newborn, love, hope, the wise person follows a star, follows an intention, follows a vision clearly. What vision will we follow now? In religious and anthropological theory, liminal space, liminal time is a holy time. It's used to describe what it's like in the middle of a rite of passage, when things feel upside down, inside out, not you aren't who you were when you began, you aren't who you will be when you end. In between, the kind of space as something is laboring to be born. We hear stories of holiness and transformation encountered in liminal space, right? In the Bible, um, the people of Moses wandering in the wilderness between slavery and the promised land, they experience the presence of God there in the wandering, in the wilderness, in the in-between. In the liminal space, everything is present. All the possibilities are still there. The pandemic is, this has been a liminal time. The pandemic has lifted the veil on so much inequity, violence, and racism, not just in this country, but in abroad. In the article, um, the Arunti Roy article, which Margaret read from today, um, she talks heartbreakingly and infuriatingly last April about how racist nationalism in India um, used COVID as yet another excuse to stigmatize and demonize Muslims with death as the result. And that's the context uh, for her assertion that we cannot and should not go back to normal, that the pandemic is a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. So also, this political moment after Wednesday can be a portal. Where will we go? We might choose the path of more locks, more fences, more walls, more security spending. 
doubling down on calling the white violent extremism terrorism, which I did earlier in this week, and I've shifted to calling it insurrection and white, uh, white violence. Um, I think the path of more locks and fences and walls and security spending cannot and will not work in the current societal framework. It will not work if white people continue to view violent white extremists as isolated and mentally unstable, uh, lone wolves rather than the logical expression of a society built on domination in general and white supremacy in particular. It will not work if the government pours resources into structures that are fundamentally racist and filled with a lot of overt actual white supremacists. So both things, you can have a system full of well-meaning people that operates in a racist way, and you can have a system that is full of like actual white supremacists. And I think our security and policing systems are, are both. Late breaking news is that uh, Seattle, at least two Seattle police officers were confirmed to have been at the insurrection. There's gonna be more of that. So if we just pour more security resources into our existing structure, we're just gonna get more of the same. If more spending on terrorism prevention was going to work, it would have. We have been doing that my entire adult life, ever since my second day of college, which the date of which happens to be 9-11-2001. This is my literal entire adult life. 20 years of focus on terrorism and security spending did not produce safety on Wednesday. What is the point of spending on domestic terrorism investigations when law enforcement can simply choose to ignore insurrection plans that were made in plain sight? The problem is they was not that this was something complicated they didn't know how to fix or find. Without accompanying societal change, more security spending is just going to put more black and brown people in jail. And it's going to result in more surveillance um, and fewer civil liberties. Um, remember those letters I was trying to deliver at the beginning of the sermon? They were about, I think, they were about civil liberties in the wake of the so-called USA Patriot Act. That's what I worked on back then. What if we choose a different vision? A vision of our country and our congregation, frankly, and our ways of relating to one another that is based on radical hospitality and opening the door to love. I challenged myself to keep this reading this week. I think there is something true that safety, Safety can be about pairing enthusiastic inclusion and relationship building with high boundaries about accept what is acceptable behavior. I think we can build a culture of safety that dismantles white supremacy rather than reinforces it. In which we understand that safety and security are built not just in, maybe not even at all, in big shows of force, but in the many small interactions that together weave a web of interconnection and accountability. Um, we've all had a lot of ex different experiences of police and policing. And for some of us, especially some of us who are white, um, there have been ways in which police have kept us safe uh, when family, community, congregation, um, friends did not. And so that's, that's really real. And I know that I felt personally, when you talk about like what it feels like to be safe, I felt much safer in a tiny, um, barely trained <laughs> uh, community safety team when I, when I worked as a part of an unarmed volunteer, very lightly trained community safety team. I felt a little more safe. I felt more safe doing that than I ever do surrounded by armed riot police. It's gonna, it's hard. Like real safety is much harder than security theater. For a lot of us, I mean, 
Um, it means we will have to take more responsibility to nip unacceptable behavior in the bud. Um, we have to say that's not okay every time, um, oh, I don't know, every time an uncle tells our kids that boys don't cry or anytime someone commits harassment at coffee hour at church, anytime someone makes assumptions about what kind of people really belong in Unitarian Universalism or in our church, I think we're going to have to build our muscle of um, noticing and saying those things um, because uh, radical hospitality, um, part of radical hospitality is holding ourselves and one another accountable, saying we care about you enough to keep you safe here. I want to close with the words of my colleague, Reverend Annie Gonzalez Milliken from this past Thursday. She wrote this on Facebook. When I see people say, this is not America, I see something else. I see, this is not who I want us to be. I see, I do not like knowing who we really are. I see this can change. Because on this land is also 500 years of indigenous resistance and survival and black resistance and survival. And on this land is the story of so many uprisings, strikes, revolts, marches, organizing meetings, mutual aid societies, underground safety networks, so many movements for liberation. On this land, the hard work of organizers in Georgia made miracles happen again yesterday. The question then is not, is this America? It is, which world are we building? Are we building power among the people, investing in economic democracy, redistributing wealth, creating community safety plans and teams, defunding police and prisons? Are we living with hope and integrity and refusing to give in to fear-based concessions? Are we putting forth local candidates we believe in and voting out useless and evil status quo leaders? Are we getting ourselves and our people free? All of us unlearning the violence and systems of supremacy we have been taught. All of us tearing down the, the institutions that uphold this violence. All of us creating a new world of care and connection and liberation, choice by choice, act by act, with rage and hope and grief and love. Another world is possible. Let's live into it." End quote. Folks, I think a newborn love is and could be on the other side of this portal. We must open the door and go through.